Water power swallowing, water bottle don't bother with it. Politicians, politics flowing like it's bottomless. Started it and finished it, water needed to swim in it. More valuable than oil, be careful homie, you spilling it. Welcome, 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 beloved community. We are back again with yet another installment of the People's Water Board Coalition's Water Wednesdays webcast. And as always, beloved family, I am here with my beloved co-host, Miss Valerie Jean. And can't forget our behind-the-scenes tech person, Miss Angelica, who does a marvelous job, by the way. And today... We have the pleasure of having, um, shall I say, an old cohort in action. Uh, definitely a big yeah. supporter of the fight for water equity and safe, affordable drinking water and sanitation for all. We have the executive director of the Great Lakes Environmental Law Center, Mr. Nick Leonard. Thank you so much for being here today, Nick. We really appreciate it. You know, taking time oh, out. We thanks, know thanks. you have a big, busy schedule yeah. to be here, so we oh, greatly appreciate it. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's like having a celebrity. The report is on. so important. <laughs> it is. You know, the report is so important um, that it, it, when I was reading it, it felt like I wish that they had done it sooner, that it had been done sooner. So I'm so grateful that you all took that. Um, by the helm and and got that report done because it's so important that people understood exactly what happened in Benton Harbor. And it's a short show, so I'm going to jump right into it, Nick. Um, and so grateful you're here. Thank you. Uh, you know, can you tell our viewers about the Benton Harbor water crisis, exactly what happened so people have kind of a basis of what, what the report is about? Yeah, certainly. So it's, it's really, when you talk about the Benton Harbor water crisis, you're really talking about kind of these twin processes of a lead crisis, which uh, came first and which was on at this point to the work, and more recently, this growing water affordability crisis. Mm -hmm. So the lead crisis really began in, in 2018. That's when the Benton Harbor water system first basically found elevated levels of lead in their drinking water now. You know, there's no safe level of lead. A lot of people know that that in, in drinking water. But what the law and the regulation requires is that if basically lead concentrations in a community go above what's called the action level, which is basically the 90th percentile of sub samples taken from a, a community like that Harbor. If that number goes above 15 plus per billion, then basically what a community has to do is like bring to action more or less to try to take action to, to lower lead levels again. Now, in 2018, we saw Benton Harbor go above that action level for the first time, and, and the new percentile was 22. Once again, the, the 90th percentile that triggers action is 15, so pretty significantly above. And what caused us concern was the persistence of the problem and the lack of a robust public health-focused response, similar to what we've done in Flint after, after their water crisis, because we knew this was you know, another, a, a city that was predominantly low income, majority black residents. And so we knew that they were going to be probably having a tough time with first getting the, the lead problem under control and then second, making sure the residents there were, were doing okay, making sure their health wasn't being impacted. And, and getting them bottled thought, water was a big deal, right? And exactly. getting them to, as a response, sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because what we saw was, you know, after that first, sort of high level of lead, it sort of, it, it just kept dragging on and dragging on. And they went on to achieve the lead action level actually for, for three consecutive years with the 90th percentile ranging from, you know, 22 to 32. And, and we were also seeing some households that had lead concentrations that were nearly 900 plus per billion, like really extremely high, extremely high levels. And, you know, in Flint, what we saw was an emergency was declared, you know, about 12 months after the, they, everybody found that there were high levels of lead in the drinking water. And here we were in Benton Harbor, and we were coming up on three years after, like, the, that 2018 instance. And, you know, it, it just was, didn't seem to be receiving the same amount of attention. Like you mentioned, bottled water wasn't available for, for residents. 
many of them didn't even know what was going on. They weren't getting clear communication. They, they certainly weren't getting urgent communication from local or state government, like, hey, this is serious. You better take it seriously. At the end of the day, they just weren't getting sort of like the wraparound public health services that we saw implemented in Flint that, you know, seemed to be really relevant for this community. And they were things that, that went beyond just our water, like making sure that all 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 parents that were on uh, WIC had access to regular formula so that they wouldn't have to mix baby formula with their tap water, knowing that, you know, infants are some of the most vulnerable. So like kind of kind of basic stuff like that of like, hey, just filters. making sure people right, the filters, making sure people can just take care of themselves, making sure people can can, you know, try to live a a, a life where they're they're gonna be safe. And so eventually, you know, we, we got linked up with Reverend Edward Pinkney and the Benton Harbor Community Water Council because we have been tracking this issue for a long time. And, and basically said like, hey, well, you know, what do you think about what's happening over there? What do you want to see happen? And, you know, we were on the same page. Like we wanted really the federal, state, and local governments to, to step up and address what was clearly becoming a, a severe public health crisis. And so we partnered with them to file an emergency petition with the EPA, basically saying to the EPA, like, hey, this is drinking water in Benton Harbor. And this was in the fall of 2021, so nearly three years after, after they had first discovered high levels of lead. And, like, basically our petition laid out the case, like, this is this is a serious problem, and the EPA serious. needs to get involved. And what was particularly disturbing to us was, like, we had tried to engage with the state on the issue before, and they basically told us that they had had it under control. And by the time we got to the fall of 2021, it was it was clear that it that it wasn't. And so we thought it was necessary to basically sign a light on this issue. And and luckily, you know, it worked. Uh, so in one sense, this is a community success story because after we filed that petition, it got the attention of national media. And then Governor Whitmer came in and, and, and basically stood up the kind of response that we thought Benton Harbor residents had needed and deserved for a long time. But in another sense, it's, it's a tragedy, right? Because it was three years. That's three years of high lead levels in drinking water. That's three years of people drinking that water. Yeah, and, and they were harmed. That's, right. that's, that's harming people. That's criminal activity right. for them exactly. to have to. Yes. Right. There's a lot of harm that comes with that. And so, you know, that it was... You know, and, and so the, what the report does is get into like, you know, why did this happen on the on the lead side of things? Like, why did first we fail to prevent this in another majority black city in Michigan? You know, not even five years after the Flint water crisis. Like, right. we're, like we're not we're not, like, I remember what the Flint water crisis was, and I remember like everybody being like, we're not going to let this happen again. This is the last time. And not only did we let it happen again, but then we responded slower than we did in Flint. So how how is this? How is this possible? But you know, at the and same time, we only time, got a response because it was national media pointed towards it. Because right. there was no response mm -hmm. before when the community right. was getting together. We were there. We we organized in Benton Harbor, so we knew that it was being ignored completely until the uh, national media right. got it. And that's really, really, you know, if you can say what anybody can say whatever they want about the governor, but the fact is, is she didn't care about this. And she didn't respond to it right. until everybody else was looking at her. It was making her look bad. And that's, that's true. That's just that's simply. Not like people people weren't asking. Right. No, the community we, was. We had to fight to get Eagle and our government to even ship and supply like bottled water and have, you know, facilities where people could readily available get access to the bottled water that they so desperately needed. And kind of what you and were talking about. And then they gave out about. filters. Remember, Nicole, they yeah. gave out filters. And yeah. nobody knew how to put the filters on. Didn't even yeah, come didn't in and make sure that the community knew it. how to do. The response was, yes, mm -hmm. Nicole, just absolutely. It was, it was. It's wrong. It was mediocre at best. Um, and yeah, that kind of be forever hung by it. Yeah, that kind of brings me yep. into one of my first questions for you, Nick. What, in your opinion, is the reasoning that you would think that it that they took so long because as you were saying, 
and we've heard this all through the activist community. Everybody was like, oh my God, you know, we had to take Flynn as a learning lesson. This should never happen again. We should do everything in our power to avoid this, but yet and still it happened again. And one of the points that I always keep going back to is that it's not just, it's so many commonalities. There's the majority black cities. It's the most disinvested, disadvantaged communities. And then on top of that, mm -hmm. both of these cities were taken over by emergency management at some point in time. That's right. So like with all of those factors, you think they would have looked at Flint and said, especially with everything that came after towards Governor Snyder, like we cannot let this ever happen again. We have to do whatever That's we can right. to prevent it, but yet they didn't. That's right. And and really it was a twofold kind of failure, right? It was a, you can touch on both. It was a failure for basketball, it was a failure to adequately respond once it did happen. Both of those things happened. Yeah. And I the first thing to emphasize is it is it was preventable. Like if anybody that was yeah. sort of paying attention and could have seen that Benton Harbor at some point was going to have a lead crisis. Because at the time when this mm -hmm. happened, they weren't using any treatment in their water to control the corrosion of lead pipes. And they, and they weren't required to under the rule. But at the same time, you know, everybody knew that they had a lot of lead pipes. Everybody knew that at some point they were just going to reach this breaking point and there was going to be that, like, basically lead pipes were going to corrode to the point where they were going to exceed the lead X level. And I think everybody also knew, or at least the people that are really deep in this work knew that once that tipping point was reached, it was going to be really hard to reverse course and bring lead levels back down. And, so, and I think both of those are really important because it was basically like if you could have invested a little bit of, of time and energy and money into upfront prevention, you know, none of this would have been necessary. And, and in fact, you know, in 2018, I remember reading a uh, basically a survey of the water system that the, the Michigan Department of Environment, Regulation and Energy did, basically noting, like, yeah, there's a lot of lead pipes here, but failing to basically push them and say, you really should think about, you know, installing some treatment to control, control the corrosion of your lead pipes, make sure you're preventing something from happening. Because once again, it's once once things went bad, like, the, the solution for these kinds of problems take a long time to work. Mm -hmm. And so people are harmed for the rest of their lives and for right. generations. Like mothers have babies that, it, that have the, you know, that have lead in their system and that's passed on from generation to generation. Right. So it's not like you were harmed for a couple minutes. Like no. I harmed, I harmed my kids and my kids are going to harm their kids because of this. Right. Yeah. Like, right. Exactly. Mm. And also, now, as I'm we a... see with Nick, oh, I'm sorry, Nick. Um, no, I no, said, go ahead. Touch on what you were saying, Valerie, because also, as we seen, even with Flint, when they provided insurance, it was really hard for adults who had been exposed to lead to get the what? full benefits of resources and medical they had to prove treatment it. that they needed because they were focusing on children mm -hmm. primarily. Which mm -hmm. a lead, uh, there's no mm -hmm. record book that says oh, lead only only affects children. It may do more harm to younger people in developmental stages, but that still does not erase the fact that it affects anyone who ingests it. That's right. Yep. Now on the on the on the response side of things, I think what we saw was like why did they respond slower here? And I mean, I think first thing is that. A lot of there was a lot of policy action that came after the Flint water crisis. Like they changed the lead and copper rule in Michigan to make it the strongest in the nation. Uh, Governor Whitmer signed an executive order aimed at making the basically rebranding the environmental department and instructing them like, hey, you have to center public health in your work and more urgently respond to public health crises. EPA did kind of the same thing. They created what's called their elevation policy that was basically like, hey, EPA staff, if you see something that looks like a public health crisis, don't be trapped by like your bureaucratic role, like things up, say something, make sure you're elevating it and make sure we're doing something about it. And you know, what we saw is just a, a failure of all of those pieces of, of policy. Like they, none of them work to protect Santa Harbor residents is, is right. the reality. And why they didn't work, uh, you know, I, I think there's some probably deep, 
and disturbing answers to those questions of like why did why essentially in Benton Harbor was the impetus for the response the same. It was residents standing up and able basically able to make enough noise in the right way that ultimately prompted you to to do something. And you know, I think the reality is those those policies don't overcome sort of the oftentimes these inherent biases that people in government may have for people of color or people of lower income. And, you know, those those, those policies aren't going to fix those sort of cultural problems in those agencies. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I think that's still one of the central problems. And, you Systematic know, racism, how, literally. Right. And how you fix it is then, I think, just creating policies that address that expressly address those those realities and yeah. basically really say like no if you see something like this you know somebody in MDHHS or somebody in EGO or somebody in EPA like you have to come here and you have to help and, yeah. and there's no like you know oh try to elevate this try to make public health the center point of your work like no we we just need it's clear that we need sort of stronger protocols that are going to require people. Uh, and require government to come in and help these communities when these things happen. The it's so it's so upsetting. Um, and if people can't, if they're listening to this and they're not infuriated, you know, you've really got to check in with yourself. Um, what were the findings of the report? Can we talk about what the findings what the findings of the report were? Yeah, definitely. So. You know, I mentioned that we, we we really talked a lot about sort of the twin processes here of lead and water affordability. And so I think the key findings on the lead side were uh, one thing that this crisis was preventable and that our sewage, they didn't take enough action to prevent it. And that those policies just didn't protect uh, the harbor residents. And they could have been used more robustly to protect them. Like Eagle could have identified that this was basically a ticking time bomb long before this crisis unfolded. And they could have used those policies more robustly to, to address it. But once again, you know, they, they just didn't. And on the water affordability side of things, you know, we, with this, the growing crisis now, we found, yeah. I think, quite a bit of disturbing information. I mean, the, the water system has a $2.5 million annual revenue deficit right now that's largely made up of various operating and administration. Uh, things like legacy pensions, water treatment costs, stuff like that. And, you know, there, there's basically three main sort of um, things that are causing that, driving that crisis. I mean, one is historical, you know, the, the white flight from Benton Harbor and the, the sort of racial segregation that's occurred in that area has meant that Benton Harbor, the city is now largely relying on regional customers to make its water system financially viable. And what you see is that sort of emergency managers in the area and Eagle has played a role in sort of essentially disinvesting from the water system in Benton Harbor. So what you see the emergency manager do, cutting staff at the water treatment plant from 10 employees to six employees and cutting contracts with uh, local companies, local corporations like Whirlpool that were key sources of revenue for the water system. You also see Eagle playing a role sort of the de-regionalization of uh, water systems in the area. So you see that, you know, at the same time, they're issuing a $12 million loan so that Ben Harbor can upgrade their water treatment plant to serve regional customers. They're issuing permits to allow some of those regional customers to leave the Ben Harbor water system. So mm -hmm. they're issuing per they're, they issue the permits to allow Ben Harbor concepts to basically construct their own water treatment plant. And that was, at the time, basically like 50% of Benton Harbor's customer base. And so wow. you basically put them with more debt to expand their water system, which is an expansion that they don't need because they're a, a sizable portion of their customer base is walking out the door. And so what, what you see right now is basically like a, a report came out earlier this year that basically estimated that in order to cover that two and a half million dollar deficit, Benton Harbor is going to have to raise water rates 20% every year the next nine years mm -hmm. and, you know if they do that the added hey. water bill is going to go from 
they estimated like sixty dollars per month to two hundred seventy five dollars per month. That's like over three thousand dollars a year that, for a, mm-hmm. for a water bill. So you think about that, like someone would need to earn basically over a hundred thousand dollars to have their water bill be affordable. And like ninety five percent of Benton Harbor residents earn less than a hundred thousand dollars. So you're talking about basically water may soon become unaffordable for an entire city. And so like, our, our key finding was this problem was so, like the, the water affordability problem in Benton Harbor is going to become so severe that it's not just gonna like be a question of, oh, how are residents gonna be able to afford their water bill? Yeah. I mean, the, the water plant itself is I think in in sort of in peril. Like it, it may sort of go the route of essentially what Detroit faced, which is basically like their water treatment plant may essentially be being like financially insolvent, like they can't support it. And so they may have to like, basically Ben Harbor will go from being the regional supplier of water to they may be basically a regional customer of water and buying water from, from another community. And, you know, given the state's role in the lead crisis, given the state's role in the deregionalization of their water system, we just think that that's not an acceptable outcome. It's absolutely that, that's a- not acceptable. And you're talking about people's actual lives, not being mm-hmm. able to afford their water. That we have, um, we've been working on these uh, state legislative bills for water affordability bills. And, you know, that that they would be essential in that case so that Benton Harbor um, residents could afford their water. Those that legislation would be essential. They would have to, and, and for that to, for them to even fathom, like putting that on the rate payers, um, uh, when, when it's really, it's the state's fault that we're in this situation. They should have been upgraded, um, these pipes throughout the entire state. So mm-hmm. that, and people living in poverty, that would, can you imagine the amount of stress that that would cause? <laughs> Just and, and the crazy thing about Benton Harbor is it's, it's, you know, usually we think of water affordability, we think of it impacting, you know, people below 200% of the federal poverty level, something like that. Like, you know, if, if this happens, like, it's going to impact, like I said, the entire community, like people that are making $100,000 a year, their water bill is going to be unaffordable. Like, right? it's so, it's just, it's such a severe problem. And you know, like I said, it, it not only threatens residents, but it threatens to really just Rip Benton Harbor is this key asset that they have and that they've relied on for so long. And we really think that not only should Benton Harbor residents have access to safe drinking water, but they should be able to basically continue to own and maintain their water treatment plant because they, I think they deserve that much. Yes. Yes. And anytime you talk about privatization or anything, it really falls on the ratepayers because corporations absolutely don't care if we can afford our water or not. Mm-hmm. You know, like anytime there's that that conversation's being had, it's always bad, mm-hmm. always bad. Um, wow. The, you know, having it just even though I know it's this bad, that that to me, when you when, like pricing people out of water, mm-hmm. it's just a huge it, it it's it's criminal, it's wrong, and I don't know how people um sleep at night who who makes these decisions i really don't i don't understand it um so folks need to know that we're going to put the report so you can read the whole report down in the description box um is there are there other places that folks could go or is that is everything in the report everything's in the report you know we basically why we did it was because you know we saw the lead crisis as being unacceptable, both the failure to prevent it Absolutely. and the failure to respond. And, you know, everybody always talks about our work there. I was like, oh, it was great you did what you did filing the petition. You know, it was too late. It was too late. Uh, residents were living with that for too long. And my, our, our instance putting out the report was like, this really has to be the last. Like, we yeah. can't have this happen again. And so we need to figure out what went wrong here. And preventive need, uh, measures put them in place right. like right. they're they're there and we right. know that all of michigan had lead pipes that need replaced the whole country yeah. does the whole damn country <laughs> it does right like yeah 
Well, I really appreciate the report and um and and you all putting it together and um standing by it and we're going to share it out everywhere. I'm really grateful that we were able to have this conversation so that folks know about the report, can read it and can get involved. You can always get involved with the People's Water Board Coalition because we work in Benton Harbor, Flint, all over Michigan where these things are happening. We organize. So we're uh, a great way for people to uh, get plugged in if they want to fight back. And um, yeah, and then, of course, uh, follow the uh, Great Lakes Environmental Law Center to learn more, too. Um, thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you so much, Nick, um, for taking the time out of your busy schedules today. <laughs> I appreciate it um, so that we are able to uh, to share these stories. Um, that's the cat. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yes, thank you both so much. Uh, thanks again for um, all the work that you do to make the world a better place, Nick. Oh, thank you all. We appreciate you. Um, and as far as our viewers go, uh, thank you for tuning in every week and supporting us. And we look forward to sharing community stories with you for, the, uh, for a long time coming every week on Wednesday. So thank you for always tuning in and try to take care of each other. Try to look out for each other and try to stay afloat. Bye. Bye. Be careful, homie. You're spilling it.